Good morning, everyone uh, from the UK. Welcome to the 16th Surface Ventures webinar. Uh, before we start, um, you probably know the drill. Can you please write where you're joining us from today in the chat box on the right hand side? My name's uh, Tahid Khan. I'm a VP um, at Surface Ventures and I'm your host for today. Uh, we are a non for profit organization and our mission is essentially to provide world class surface engineering education for academia and industry. So every month we bring you a sector leading speaker to present current challenges and future trends in surface engineering. Alongside surface engineering uh, workshops and live equipment demonstration. Great. Um, thank you. It seems that everything is working, uh, which is great. Many great places there. Um, so today it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Michael Bryant, who will be discussing functional surfaces and interfaces in orthopedic technologies. Um, Dr. Bryant uh, is an associate professor in tribology and corrosion engineering in the Institute of Functional Surfaces um, at the University of Leeds. His research focuses on tribological and surface interaction of materials used in biomedical applications. The research is uh, currently funded as a PI and co-I through the uh, EPSRC, Wellcome Trust, Royal Society and Industry. He was awarded the IMECI Duncan Dowson Prize and the Sir Thomas Hawksley Gold Medal in 2018. So in terms of uh, agenda, we'll start uh, with the presentation, then switch over uh, for a few minutes to our partner, Brooker, who will be showing some videos. And then we'll come back to the presenter for your questions. Um, a quick note on questions, please type these into the chat box and they will be marked uh, for the uh, question and answer session. We are planning to uh, go for around 60 minutes in total today. Uh, however, depending on the questions, this may go over, so we do apologize if this happens. Um, a quick reminder about our website, um, which is surfaceventures.org. It features videos from our previous talks, information regarding upcoming webinars, and information about the Surface Ventures team. Um, as always, we always like to learn a little a bit about you, our audience. So there'll be a quick poll uh, coming out now. As with previous events, can you please answer the question that should pop on your screen uh, right now? Which of these best describes your current uh, position? Brilliant. We've got a, a nice mixture of industry and PhD students and postdocs. So on that note, um, I'd like to hand over to our speaker uh, for today, Mike, over to yourself. Thank you, David. Uh, nice to meet you all. I can see in the uh, in the list of people that are uh, that are attending that there's some familiar faces. So it's nice to see you and uh, and some new faces as well. So it's also also nice to nice to meet new people virtually in a in a world that we're that we're now this virtual world that we're now living in. Um, thank you to Tweed and Sam for the opportunity to present today. Um, and really, what I'm going to present is a, is an overview of, of some of well some of the work that we've been doing uh, within the institute that focuses around biomedical services, biomedical interfaces. Uh, and by no means is this work of just myself. This is work of a of a group, um, you know, may, mainly PhDs, postdoc students. Um, every now and again, I'll, I'll venture down into the labs. It tends to cause more more hassle than good when I enter the labs, but ultimately, it's the work of the of, of the PhDs and uh, uh, and the uh, and the postdocs within the lab. And particularly today, we'll be talking talking around the the biotribal corrosion work. We'll really split this into into three sections where we'll talk about the um, some of the recent work in, on on kind of tribal corrosion mechanisms that we've been doing. So the work of um, uh, Blake Thornley and and Mohammed Telfikaram, uh, who have who've recently graduated, and then we'll we'll move more on to the kind of the you know the advanced simulation, how we simulate uh, things within a with with complex biomechanics. And surface engineering, which is really some of the work that Rob Beadling uh, has been doing as well. And again, as I said, it's part of a team by myself, with, with myself, Richard Hall, 
and Neville and, and Duncan Dowson when he was when he was still at Leeds. So, just as a high level introduction, we you know our, our work really specialises in in the in medical devices. So within our within our subgroup within IFS, and what we're particularly interested in is, is are the are the interactions between those medical devices and and the environments in which they're interacting with, <clears throat> you know, and just as a layman's term. In, in terms of describing what a medical device is, there are very, very set guidelines and very set, um, very set descriptions of these. But ultimately, these are any any instrument, apparatus, appliance, software, or material that are that are intended for use within within a human being. And these are all these. This description here are very interesting because it's not just a, a, a device, something like a hip replacement, but it can be electronical devices, but also then the software that goes goes along with them. You know, and within an era of uh, like digitalization, you know, the challenges are ever ever changing, and so the the materials and and the environment and the technology that we're working with is is ever changing. You know, and I think we, you know, if you're lucky enough not to have a medical device, we all know somebody that has or does have a medical device. You know, hip joints, knee joints, contact lenses, things like stents. Um, you know cochlear ear implants you know they're all classed as as medical devices and ultimately they they need to be designed you know at some point by an engineer to to effectively interact with with the biological environment and that maybe sounds like quite an obvious thing but i think in reality that is something that is probably miss you know sometimes missing from design of these implants as we focus more on kind of global global high level performance rather than the interfacial interactions and the interfacial mechanisms that are occurring that, that ultimately dictate or drive um, uh, 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 the performance of these materials and these devices. You know, and ultimately be, because of some of the high level failures and some of the high level uh, 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 revision rates, high level kind of scandals around medical devices. So whether it be a metal on metal hip or a breast implant, you know, ultimately, the, U, uh, the EU have, have, have redesigned their medical device regulations, and ultimately, they put, they've now put an emphasis on, on, on the kind of a study of nanomaterials and biocompatibility, really to ensure the safety of these devices. And this is really a key, a key consideration, a key talking point at the moment in terms of what is, what is you know, what, what defines a safe, a safe device, you know, and we, you know there are there are huge and you know there are many application many many examples in other literature that I think and in, in, in industry that I think you know the medical sites can can draw on. And so we'll be talking a bit about bit about the work that we've been been doing to really understand understand these and how to kind of feed into these you know these ever changing medical device regulations that you know from an industry point of view are becoming from an innovation point of view that you know they're stifling that innovation and there's there are risks around kind of legacy products and uh and medical devices that have got a long established history of being clinically effective effectively being lost from the market because of these uh these evolving uh, uh these evolving medical devices and i've also put biocompatibility there it needs to be con considered and i put a question mark next to it because you know one of the things that i always that i that I try and get people to think about is, you know, what is biocompatibility? You know, we talk about cobalt chrome alloys, we talk about ceramics as being passive and inert and biocompatible materials. But I think there are a number of cases within within the within both well within both clinical application and the literature which which demonstrates some you know that this biocompatibility can be subjective, and it's also often specific to the to the application in which you're you're using these materials and you're using these devices, and so there's a you know, when you're when you're developing these devices, you need to be thinking holistically about how these materials are going to be used, how they're going to be, uh, you know, what their intended application is, and what their what their operating environment is, and the importance of considering the human body really as a as a system. But regardless of all of this, the thing that that unites all of these is the fact that these. Uh, uh, you know, all, all of these devices, whether it is a pacemaker, whether it's a knee joint or hip joint, essentially their surfaces and their interfaces need to be designed or engineered to be functional with the biological environment. And again, there are a lot of questions around how you do that and what we do, um, how you test them, what we test in, what's the appropriate test methodology, you know, and then there's some big questions around how, you know, how do you test for a population? You know, how do you test the best case scenario, worst case scenario? 
um, you know, and and do we should we be testing to to replicate failure or should we be testing to benchmark? And so there are some big high level questions that we can, you know, as academics, we're uh, we're lucky enough to be able to to pontificate about. But you know, the the implications of us of, of us thinking about this have you know have serious implications in terms of how 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 these devices are developed in the future and how we can you know and ultimately we can play a, you know quite a significant role in how we streamline. And how we can accelerate that development of of new devices, which industry wants, but at the same time ensuring that they're uh, uh, that they that they're safe as well. But you know, our, our philosophy really is that to be able to do this, you know, to be able to accelerate this development of uh, of uh, of these medical technologies, we ultimately need to know what the fundamental, or we need to have a good grasp of the fundamental, you know, degradation or the performance processes are. You know, and, and unfortunately, whilst we have ISO and ASTM standards, you know, they, they only go part of the way in terms of understanding those. And, you know, particularly within the medical device field, a lot of those are, are simplistic, simplistic measures of wear. Um, you know, there are things around particulate measurements and particulate methods, um, you know, which we've also contributed to. Um, but then there's also, um, you know, there's also questions around things like metal ion release and how you, how you essentially consider that and th you know there are, there are some big questions around around the the use and the validity of these of these standards particularly when when we know that they don't essentially replicate what we see uh, in in vivo so the focus of our work really is is at Leeds has been for the last probably five to ten years as well within IFS has been uh, around total joint replacements and the reason for this is that there are approximately 1.7 million uh, billion people worldwide living with some musculoskeletal condition, you know, and, and these conditions ultimately give rise to, you know, poor quality of life, um, you know, lost days in terms of work, you know, high impacts in terms of loss of GDP, high impacts of the economy, you know, and then essentially the treatment comes at a cost to the, well, within the UK, it comes to the cost of the care provider, uh, uh, or, or the patient, depending on where you uh, where you are, and essentially things you know, uh, you, uh, co uh, conditions such as osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you know, ultimately the end sta the end stage treatment or the gold stage treatment still remains total joint replacement, you know, and with that comes you know quite significant uh, surgery, you know, this whilst the surgery is considered to be one of the you know one of the best surgeries of uh, in in modern surgery. You know, it, it comes, uh, it, you know, there are some significant costs in terms of cost to the NHS, but also patient costs in terms of the, the invasiveness of the, of the joint replacement procedure itself. But ultimately, once you've, uh, you know, once you've you put in a joint replacement, you know, essentially these things have a finite lifetime, you know, and whilst we want the joint replacement technology to outlist, out, outlive a patient, which traditionally it did, now what we see is as, as the demographics are, are emerging, you know, people are pe people are living longer. They're more active, but there's also a demand for joint replacement in more active and younger patients. Essentially, we're we're in a situation where the lifetime of a joint replacement may not necessarily outlive the life expectancy of that patient. And so, essentially, now what we need, to, you know, with the shifting demographic and the shifting sands in terms of the the requirements of these devices, you know, there is a need for longer lasting uh, joint replacement joint replacement technologies that will that will that will give that will ultimately enhance the uh, the quality of the life and and and, and reduce the need for um, uh, you know further replacement surgeries. You know, and, and in terms of numbers within the UK, there's been a, there's been nearly three million joint replacement procedures uh, conducted between since two thousand and three. So this is estimated from the UK National Joint Registry figures. You know, so this is just the UK alone, and typically these are knees and hips. But we're, now we're seeing an emerging kind of trend in in implants like shoulders, ankles, uh, and elbows. And these are these implants are mainly for um, uh, are mainly for uh, restore restoring motion, uh, and uh, and ultimately to uh, to enhance, well, like I said, that quality of life. One of the things that isn't captured in the National Joint Registry figures is is ultimately the the interventions that are required for the spine. You know, and actually spinal health and spinal complications and, and, uh, uh, and issues around uh, pain in the spine actually tend to dominate 
musculoskeletal health conditions above hip, knees, hips, shoulders, and ankles. Um, and again, the you know the, a very similar requirement in terms of uh, uh, materials, device, uh, materials longevity, materials performance, and materials uh, uh, and device uh, testing is is required. But the spine is even more complicated by the fact that it's uh, you know you it's near the spinal cord. There's complications around that in terms of you know in, incurring disability. But it's also complicated in terms of a joint structure as well and how you define that joint structure so if you think about how you how you move around you know a hip we can typically define as being like a ball in a socket but how you define how a spine moves is is very different to how we how we define that hip so there are additional additional challenges within within that area as well so as i mentioned most of the work that we've done and a lot of the work that I'll present today is kind of aimed around total hip replacements, but within the UK, you know, total hip replacement has has had a has had a really long kind of illustrious history, dating back to the you know early 60s with uh, uh, Sir John Charnley, who really was the um, was the inventor of the modern day hip replacement, um, where he developed you know he developed a system based on a, 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 a stainless steel stem, a PTFE, uh, a PTFE. Uh, 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 as a tabular liner and essentially he 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 wanted to develop a device that re somewhat replicated the natural joint uh natural joint function both in terms of range of motion but also in terms of friction as well and then since then we've seen this development all the way through uh, up until modern day and so this has ended at 20 uh, 2010s but actually we're now in now that we're in 2020 we're now seeing a kind of a bit of a loop over in some of these technologies but ultimately, what we've seen is that the general device design and the general philosophy has remained the same. But ultimately, these materials and these and these systems have developed. So we've we've had new, you know, within the seventies, we had the development of uh, stem cement or, or bone cement, which which has been used for for ultimately anchoring these uh, prosthesis in place. Eighties and nineties, we had a lot of development in terms of the materials. So kind of deviation away from your typical three one six stainless steels. You know the adoption of things like uh, high nitrogen stainless steels and 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 the use of cold block the use of cobalt chrome from the early 70s you know and also the development of technical ceramics as well and with with a lot of this what we also find is that they 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 went from these different materials to to also these modular components where essentially rather than having a, a hit, what we would call a monoblock stem where you had your head your femoral head attached to the stem through and they were typically formed through a, a forging process and then they were ground. We we ultimately had the the introduction of these modular systems where you where they made use of things like Morse type tapers uh, to to assemble components. Um, and ultimately, what that did is it kind of revolutionised the the whole use of total hip replacements because what it meant is that surgeons could have a better control in terms of implant size, implant offset. Uh, it's better and match the anatomy, but it also meant that they could choose different materials as well. And it also meant that companies could sell different materials as well for things like bearing bearing surfaces and so you know we ultimately arrived at ultra low these ultra low bearing bearing combinations but in doing that it introduced different uh different uh different problems modularity you know introduced things like crevices you know where where fretting corrosion take place you know and whilst you whilst you give with one hand you take with another hand and ultimately there there were then complications in terms of fretting corrosion which have which have emerged and have really kind of stayed around uh, uh up and up, up and today we then in the early 2000s we had the development of uh uh of metal on metal resurfacing so metal on metal wasn't some wasn't new it was it was done in the early 70s late 60s early 70s by mckee farrah um but it was kind of thrown out of the uh, it was kind of thrown out of the pram because of the manufacturing procedures were and manufacturing tolerances were weren't high enough and essentially in 2000s we uh, uh there were there was a development of these hip resurfacing systems which were essentially metal on metal but because the manufacturing processes had had developed so well so much over over the over the period of uh of two to three decades they were essentially able to make these devices with very high tolerances you know, which could, you know, theoretically promote fluid film lubrication, EHL lubrication, if you, if you kind of believe that, then yeah, okay. Um, but essentially, these these devices were demonstrated to be lower, lower wearing, you know, high, you know, better performing, you know, and than the traditional kind of metal and polymer systems. 
And so they were kind of, up, you know, they were implanted in their droves in both younger patients and older patients. And ultimately, within five or 10 years, we saw that there were massive, you know, there were massive complications in terms of metal ion release, metal particular release as these things, you know, started to degrade in a way that we didn't really know or understand. And then since then, you know, we've we've kind of had this, you know, the, this, there have been developments in different materials, technologies, different combinations. So things like, diff, you know, ceramic on ceramic on polymer bearings, uh, ceramic on ceramic, you know, and essentially, you know, the uptake of these devices has, has, has generally been on the increase since the uh, since the since the mid two thousands. And essentially, this is this is given through the fact that the procedure is so successful, but also the fact that the demographics are changing. And people, you know, when you get to seven, you know, when you're in your seventies now, you know, at some point, you know, I can remember. Well, I say I can remember, but um, you know. 70 at one point was was considered to be old age but actually when you're in your 70s now a lot of people are still doing what they wanted to be doing in their 50s or 40s so it's all about and you know maintaining that mobility and maintaining uh, maintaining that quality of life and and that independence as well which is which is one of the drivers for for these uh, for these hip replacements so when we look at a um a, a hip replacement from a from an engineering point of view essentially we we've got you know we've got this system here where we've got a femoral stem which goes in your femur that will interface with the bone and it can either be cemented or it can be have a porous kind of coating on there that'll that'll promote some bone in growth but then we also have a series of other components where we have a femoral head typically made from cobalt chrome or maybe ceramic some alumina based ceramic and then an acetabular cup which goes in your pelvis um, which again can be you know Metal on metal articulations still do exist, and they're still put in by some people that that believe in that technology. And, it, and in, you know, in all you know, with all respects, it works well in certain demographics. Um, you know, but this could be also polyethylene or, or ceramic as well. But from an engineering point of view, when we look at this, and from an in, you know, from a surface and an interface engineer, and also from a tribology point of view, there are a number of interfaces here that you know essentially need to be designed to interact, and they need to be designed to function. In a way that is, you know, that in a way that is acceptable from a patient point of view, but also from a, uh, but also from a, uh, um, from an engineering point of view as well. You know, and typically when we talk about engineering failure of components, you know, we talk about gross fracture, you know, gross fatigue failure, um, you know, you know, kind of these things breaking. Whereas in orthopedics, it's you know the the failure doesn't typically come from the engineering failure of of, uh, uh, of these devices. It's ultimately a biological interaction that that drives the need for the revision. But what that means is that our tolerance for failure or our criteria for failure of these devices or our, or our test criteria needs to be in line with with that biological response. And you know that becomes a very hard question, hard question to uh, uh, to access and to kind of. Uh, Define because ultimately everybody reacts differently to to these implants. You know, they but people have different tolerances, uh, uh, and and people people interact with with the with the debris in very different ways. But what we can see here is that we have you know a range of tribological contact conditions, but we also have a number of interfaces that are coming into contact as well. So we've got wear processes or tribal corrosive wear processes where we've got these mixture of tribology and chemical processes. But we have things like gross sliding taking place at the at the at the bearing interface, and then things like crevice corrosion, fretting corrosion that will occur at these modular taper interfaces as well. And you know the bearing surfaces, you know, have have, have received a lot of a lot of interest in the past past ten to fifteen years. You know, and and you can see that in the fact that you know we now have very very low ultra you know ultra low wearing systems. You know, not without their issues either. Have, you know we must add um but things like these modular taper interfaces where you've got issues with crevice corrosion fretting corrosion they've they have received interest but they you know problems still persist and there's actually not a full real kind of appreciation or a full agreement in terms of what are the factors that drive uh, uh these this degradation within these uh, within these interfaces so when we when we take these implants out the body they they rarely come out looking like brand new uh, brand new is the day that they went in you know so they tend to come out with these black deposits evidence of corrosion taking place degradation on these surfaces you know and this can range from kind of blackening of the surface dulling of the surface where you where we see these kind of reaction 
these tribochemical reaction films, maybe the buildup of oxides and the reorientation of maybe some of these surface layers within within these threatening crevice corrosions. But it also goes all the way through to where you have gross wear as well. I mean, these are these are very, very rare, rare occasions, but again, they do happen. You know, so we can see, you know, in the, to one, the top left image, one in from the stem, we can see this modular taper that's essentially worn down to a, you know, the, the, the most taper was worn down to a nubbing, you know, and similarly, you know, down in your bottom right, there's an image here of a hip replacement. I found this on LinkedIn actually of a of a patient where they where they well where seemingly the femoral head had worn through whatever liner was there uh, and through the uh, uh, and through the uh, through the acetabulous shell as well. And so the performance of these devices is is you know it's wide ranging. It's you know it, it's massive. You know it depends on you know the the observations when you take these out of the body vary significantly depending on you know, where they've been put in, how they've been put in. But ultimately, it's driven by the surgeon, these implant and these patient variables that are all interacting to, to, to govern the performance of these uh, these devices. You know, and, and when we have these issues of wear and corrosion, you know, they tend to be accompanied by soft tissue reactions where, you know, where we have the, you know, we have a formation of, uh, uh, you know, necrosis, we have formation of pseudotumors, and essentially you get these tissue ultimately is, is dies around these these implants and and ultimately that is that is what drives a need for need for this revision these revisions so the work that we've been doing recently is has really gone gone back to basis so you know within within the area of hip kind of tribology there is you know there's a lot of work in that area you know and and one of the reasons for the fact that these devices are now so successful is the fact that there's, there has been a lot of tribological and tribal corrosion more recently attention paid to those those devices but what we wanted to do really was go back to basics and really try and understand what the what the nature of these materials are and how they how they interact with the body you know and, and really that's driven by the philosophy that you that you can't really understand how these materials are going to interact until you how they're going to perform unless you understand you know, on a fundamental level, how these materials interact and, and what and, and, and how they're how they're comprised and how they're built up uh, within the uh, uh, the material performance itself. And so, you know, we talked a bit about the materials that are used. So things like cobalt chrome alloys, stainless steel alloys are typically used. And the reason for that is because they're they're, they're termed as being passive or they're termed as being, you know, and, they, and as a result of their their passive nature, they're, they're also deemed as being biocompatible. But what I've, what I put here is I put the, you know, I've named this slide the passive alloys and, and these are, these are in uh, uh, <coughs> inverted, uh, these are in, uh, these are highlighted, but essentially, you know, these materials are passive, you know, they form this 10 to, 10 to well, this two to 10 nanometer thick passive layer on the surface. Um, but essentially, this passive film is is like a thin ceramic film on a surface, kind of akin to a piece of chewing gum. And essentially, what you have is this very, very thin protective layer on a surface that is then on top of a you know quite soft, quite ductile metallic surface. And so, any mechanical stresses that you have, any 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 tribological shear, any abrasion, or, uh, or any fatigue that you have, essentially will disrupt this oxide film, and it exposes this bulk. This bulk uh, it exposes a bulk surface, which is very reactive in nature due to the alloying elements that are there, and it, it interacts with the biological environment, and which then ultimately leads to you know enhanced enhanced corrosion. You know you get reformation of that passive film in in some cases, but uh, but ultimately you know this film when it's in the body now be, and when it's in the body and under mechanical loading ultimately becomes you know is ultimately in a dynamic state of either removal or, you know, enhanced transport across those films. And what we we're really interested in doing was, you know, looking at what these surfaces were. So, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at material protein interactions and their interactions with the environment. And so what we needed to do here was initially first look at what those surfaces look like. So this is just what a, what a surface of a, of, a uh, of cobalt chrome looks like. It's, it's low carbon raw cobalt chrome typically used in things like stems and some manufacturers use it for heads, uh, typically smaller heads. It, it was ground, you know, down to 10, 10 nanometers to represent the surface finishes that we typically have. 
uh, within with these, within these in, interfaces. But essentially, what we have here is that you know is a very smooth surface where we have a formation of you know these very small carbides or these carbide -like, carbide light -like structures within uh, within the surface. You know, looking at the looking at these then with the TEM, so we 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 then use a focused ion beam to take etches or to take uh, samples out of these materials uh, out of a surface to look at the subsurface. And essentially, what we can what we see is that these you know with these cobalt chromes because of their because they're metastable or their their crystal structure is metastable in in nature. We essentially see that at the very top interface we have this nanocrystalline layer, which is which is usually a, a HCP um uh, type structure which is which arises as a result of um uh, a, a result of a grinding process here or the or the shear induced process that's taking place but then we normally have that then a fairly well you know fairly well homogenized kind of distribution of elements and grain structure underneath what we did see with these you know with these alloys is that you also then get this enrichment of moly at the in, near interface just below the passive film but then we also get this segregation of, you know, certain alloying species, molybdenum and chrome within the alloy as well. And this is something that is, you know, it's reported to some degree in cast alloys where you where you have a, you know, an homogeneous kind of cooling rates. But it's, it's something that's not often reported within within wrought materials and, uh, and, and materials that are typically ground and, and uh, ground and polished. But understanding this is important because we'll talk a bit in in the next few slides about this but understanding this interaction and where this molly goes at the near interface is important in terms of how it then forms that passive film you know so we typically talk about these passive films either being chrome oxide or titanium oxide in in the case of titanium alloys but ultimately these you know these 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 different elements contribute to the formation of these passive films and that's important when it comes down to a corrosion initiation point of view but also from a protein uh, environmental interaction as well I always like to show this image. It's a bit outdated now, actually, but it took me a long time to get. So this was one from my PhD, but we essentially were able to image these passive films. And, you know, they're, you know, they're relatively thin, two to 10 nanometers, where you get this kind of hierarchical structure of an oxide on the surface, and then some additional sub, sub layer under there um, that, that contributes to that formation of a passive film. But one thing that you've got to take away is that these, you know, whilst these passive materials are very corrosion resistant, whilst they've got these passive films, Essentially, once those films are, are, are removed, they're abraded, you know, you expose, as I said, you expose the nascent, nascent metal underneath, which is very reactive, you know, and, and, and in a similar way to tri tribochemistry in, in automotive environments, you know, the, the materials will interact with, with the surrounding environment and they, they will then complex and, and, and go, on to, uh, uh, go on to interact very differently than what we would assume a bulk, bulk material would. And again, using XPS, we can look at that we can look at that surface oxide formation we, and we can see that it's a mixture of hydroxides ultimately because of the grinding process that we've used but it also contains cobalt oxides moly oxides in there as well as your predominantly chrome oxides as well and again we had confirmation of the metal carbides <coughs> within uh, within that surface as well so to understand how we how these materials interact with uh, with the biological environment it's it's important that we understand what the biological environment is and you, you know you can read textbooks and you can read literature and you know what they'll tell you is that the body is kind of you know the biological environment is you know if you want to replicate it we would use things like a sodium chloride solution maybe a phosphate buffered saline you know and then maybe you would put some put some proteins in there and and uh, uh, and that and you know that's kind of the way that we would that w that we would simulate that but again it's you know it's it, it's a very complicated system. It, it contains many, many elements, you know, and within, you know, those elements both go to dissolve salts. They go to dissolve things, you know, like things so sodium chloride, for example, but they also go to phosphates as well and sulfates um, that all contribute and all interact with the surfaces in very different ways. But along with these inorganic species, we also have a number of organic species that are formed as well. So proteins, you know, within your body, you know, are there for vital uh, function of a biological function but essentially when we put an artificial material within the body that that material needs to interact with it and needs to needs you know and essentially we need to be able to engineer and design a system that that optimizes those interactions and they'll form you know they'll form organic complexes things like proteins uh things like uh, um 
Uh, they'll form proteins, they'll form uh, mu uh, well in some cases mucins, well mucin is a protein. But all of these all of these proteins, all of these uh, all of these large molecular weight uh, species all 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 provide a specific function in vivo, but they all interact with these materials very differently. You know, one of the things that we're told from school, I, I can remember from our from GCSE biology lessons, is that the human body's pH is around about seven point four. You kind of get a, you, you were always taught this this uh, uh, this number, and I can remember from from GCSE biology that it was seven point four. But the pH of your body is is both varies both in time and in location. You know, and so within within you know within you know whilst the general ph across different you know within tissues maybe around 7.4 you know <clears throat> within within the gastric system that can go down to as low as one um but also within within the hip joint system it can also vary as well you know so that ph can vary depending on if there's infection there if there's inflammation there uh, and it can also depend on you know the actual biology and if there's any comorbidities of, of, of those patients as well so even within just understanding this environment, there's, there are huge variables that, that go into play. And how we simulate for these is, is, is vitally important in terms of understanding how these materials degrade and how they, how they are, uh, and ultimately how they'll, they'll, they'll function in, in the longer term. So some of the, some of the work that we've done again recently um, was, was to look at the, uh, the electrochemical properties of these, uh, these materials and really to observe the effects of the passivity mechanisms we employed a number of electrochemical techniques uh, where we ultimately varied and we, we took a very simplistic approach to varying the, the environment. And so we looked at your saline solution, which is which is a 0.9% NaCl. We, we looked at PBS, which is essentially a saline solution with the addition of phosphates. And then we then looked as well, then there's the interactions between these, between uh, this, uh, between proteins. And in this case, we used bovine serumalbumin, which is, which, which was used because it's really a, a, an analog of, 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 of one of the one of the large globular proteins that are typically found within uh, within the body. So it's a very well controlled, very well ideal, idealized kind of system. But what we wanted to do, you know, with the knowledge that we were really oversimplifying the system, was to understand these material uh, interactions. And we ultimately found that, you know, the presence of both phosphates and and proteins essentially affected both the, both the corrosion corrosion rates of these materials, but it also affected the passivity and the nature of the passivity of these materials. So it changed ultimately the structure of these of these passive films that formed uh, formed on the surface. And in general, we found that phosphates tended to reduce the corrosion currents uh, of these materials. So what we would typically define as I core. So if we look at this middle, <coughs> this, mid, this top middle uh, image on uh, on the slide, this is a, a polarization, a cyclic polarization curve where we've essentially immersed our sample within a lubricant and then we can uh, uh, basically apply a voltage and measure the current at the same time and it gives us some indication about the corrosion resistance we can infer the corrosion rates but it also tells us about the susceptibility of that passive film uh, breakdown but also reformation as well and, it's, and in general the phosphates tended to reduce this corrosion current and and, and these passive currents but they also tended to then also reduce uh, this what we would call this breakdown potential. So it tended to give an indication that you know whilst the, whilst the phosphates decrease the the gent wall, the the kind of the overall dissolution, the static dissolution, the susceptibility of these films to breakdown and to loss due to corrosion was increased with with the presence of phosphates. And similarly, we can we can then look and we can use uh, impedance type methods where we essentially apply a, an AC impedance to a uh, um, uh, to the materials, excuse me. You know, and through through the analysis of these data, we can we can start to understand you know how these how these uh, how these species and how these inorganic and these organic species are interacting. And what we can see is that you know by by modelling these with what we would call equivalent circuits, we can estimate the electrical properties of these films, but we can also infer some you know thickness properties as well. Of these passive films that form you know and what we can see is that you know these phosphates essentially you know contribute to you know enhancing this you know enhancing the film this passive film formation but then when you have the presence of proteins in there we essentially get this competitive absorption mechanism taking place which which essentially decreases the thickness of these of these passive films <clears throat> 
you know, and this is quite a powerful, a powerful uh, <clears throat> tool to use. You can use it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's adopted widely across, across different areas, but within, within the, uh, within the area of uh, uh, kind of bio corrosion, bio tribal corrosion, it's a really powerful technique because we can, you know, we can vary parameters quite simplistically and then see how these materials and how, how they, how they interact with the environment and how that changes. But this electrochemical, you know, these, this electrochemical analysis basically demonstrates that the, you know, the, what we have here are they, you know, again, we have complex interactions occurring between the phosphates and the proteins that essentially reduce the passive corrosion mechanisms, um, but they also reduce the integrity of this passive film. You know, and whether this is through a film thinning or through, uh, you know, kind of a, 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 a kind of substitutional uh, type mechanism, we're not we're not quite sure yet. But essentially, these 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 inorganic and these organic molecules that are present within within these environments interact very, interact in a complex way with these these materials, and they they affect both the kind of a static corrosion, but also the initiation mechanisms as well. So prior to moving on to the tribal corrosion processes, where we where we introduce a whole range of different variables, we wanted to really try and understand what happens when we you know what happens to the film reformation mechanisms once we've removed these films and then let them reform you know and, and one of the ways that we can do this is to use use electrochemical techniques to essentially cleave or or, or remove the oxide on that surface uh, and then essentially you know apply a very very negative voltage to remove that oxide off the surface and then essentially ramp that up very quickly to then 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 promote and and, and force ultimately that repassivation process where, where where we'll drive this film formation and essentially what we get when we do that we, is we get these these exponential decays where we see that there's a very initial high, you know initially a very very high current and then essentially this then plateaus down and this represents the fact that we've removed the film we've got this high high burst of dissolution taking place and then essentially then the foot film then reforms we get initial initial film formation and essentially film thickening over these over these time periods and we can fit these with two with a two time a two exponential time decay uh type fit equations where we can then model those uh model those processes very easily and, and understand how they how, how the two two time constants change but essentially the repassivation rates vary with the environment and the, and, and essentially what we saw was that the repassivation rates fa the fastest repassivation rates were observed in phosphate containing environments uh and then with the addition of these PB uh, with these uh, with these large globular proteins, we essentially see that the rates of this film formation essentially de uh, uh, well, well the rates of uh, we essentially have slower rates of repassivation. And again, this fits with this hypothesis of that we have uh, this kind of competitive absorption between the phosphates. You know, when you've just got phosphates on their own, you know, they they absorb to the surface. But then with time, uh, with the additional protein, we essentially get this. Uh, this competitive absorption owing to the size and the, and, and, the, uh, and the thermodynamics of their absorption, where we essentially see the proteins slowing that slowing that repassivation. You know, and this is really important when we're thinking about if we've got a mechanical interaction, we remove that oxide film. What we want from a from a patient point of view and from a functional point of view, we want that oxide film to reform as quickly as possible to reduce the amount of cobalt chrome ions being released from released from the surface. But what we also see is we can you can manipulate these you can manipulate these uh, diagrams and we can, we can essentially fit them to different uh, uh, different uh, 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 different equations and we can ultimately see that you know the integrity of the passive films are also decreased as well with the with the inclusion of these proteins we get films that are less compact you know kind of more porous uh, than than they would be with, with without the presence of those films. Now with XPS, we can see that they that they vary with uh, um, the chemistry of these films vary, but more importantly, we can see that the the rate the 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 ions released through I, through ICP analysis varies as well. You know, and what we see here is that with the addition of proteins, we see that we start to get a selective dissolution or an enhanced dissolution of the of this moly, and this is something that's not really being reported on. You know, we usually assume that it's going to be cobalt or chrome because they're the dominant species. But what we find is that with the addition of these proteins, we start to get this predominant release of moly from these uh, from these interfaces. And again, with the AFM, we can really kind of confirm that. So we can see that with the uh, with you know in these sodium chloride, we get these kind of domed oxide formations. Uh, 
uh, as a result of a repassivation. And then with the presence of phosphates, we kind of get these fluffy films. And then again, we can see with the PBS uh, and the NACL in the presence of, of, of proteins, we can essentially see that we get these globular films formed uh, in the presence of these uh, these these fluffier kind of uh, phosphate film layers. So it really, really complements what we've seen before. And then similarly, TM imaging of that just confirms it again. So we, we get these relatively thin thin layers formed. So, you know, between four, between six to 12 nanometers in thickness, uh, they get these protein films. But the most interesting thing is, is when we look at the composition of things, these, we have these protein films formed on top of these oxide films. But through all of this, we've got this, comp we, we, we see evidence of both carbon and we see evidence of both metal within both these oxide films and within, um, within these protein films. So it's obvious that there's some complexion taking place. You know, these things are interacting, they're reacting with each other. And they're essentially forming then these complex layers on the surface, which are no longer similar in nature to these uh, uh, to these native oxide layers that are formed. And what you've got to remember is that these have been formed under very simplistic condition. You know, no mechanical shear, no 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 real perturbing of a system other than electrochemically. You know, and we're we're still seeing that we get these you know these complex protein interactions. Similarly, we, we've done these under shear, and we can see that again the effects of, uh, of lubricant both affect both the OCP. So we see this typical depassivation, but the nature of the organic species within these within these uh, within these uh, layers both affects the electrochemistry, but it also affects the friction as well. And we can see that when you have you know the presence of organic layers, uh, organic species within these lubricants, the friction is usually a lot lower compared to non-organic containing lubricants. And that's nothing new. That's, that's been established for a long time. But what's, what's interesting is that you can have an organic containing lubricant and the rates of corrosion can be very different and they don't seem to correlate with both either the wear or the friction. So for instance, here we can see that DMEM gives us a, you know, relatively low friction. Uh, DMEM is a, uh, is a, is a, is a, um, cell culture media mainly full of it's mainly like pbs with with amino acids we see a very different response in ocp the wear tends to be a lot lower but we still see one of the highest corrosion uh, rates uh, within that now and what that suggests is that essentially we have this variation in this in these tribal corrosion uh, degradation mechanisms where we can where we can quite easily manipulate the mass loss mechanisms you know so we can we you know we can describe this tribal corrosion as being a this simultaneous interaction between the wear and the corrosion. Um, but essentially we have, you know, material owing from pure wear, pure corrosion, and these synergistic interactions where we have this wear enhanced corrosion and this corrosion enhanced wear. But it's really, you know, our philosophy is, is that it's really important that you understand these, these synergies, because if you don't understand these synergies, how can you, how can you engineer a system to effectively combat, you know, the fundamental degradation mechanism? You know, and, and as part of that, when you're when you're validating these materials, it's it's vitally important that you understand the lubricants that you're using as they become you know intrinsic to to the mechanism in which your material is being lost. You know, and we can plot these the ratios of these synergies to find out which mechanism is dominant, and we can see that you know by manipulating these fluids, we can vary. You know, we can go from being in a synergistic corrosion regime where we have you know wear and house corrosion to being in an antagonistic regime. You know, we can look a bit more simplistically, looking on a mechanistic point of view, <clears throat> and we can see that you know we can you know we, we can quite easily sit within these these corrosion wear regimes or wear wear dominated regimes, and it and it's all through the, how you know ultimately the the choice of these fluids and how we can, you know, ultimately the choice of how we set up our experiments. And again, the tribochemistry of these becomes very complex. Um, you know, we see that the formation of these films is very different depending on, on the nature of the lubricants used. You know, and what was particularly interesting is, you know, there was quite a famous paper in this area that reported that the, you know, low friction was induced by ordered carbon layers. You know, we've not been able to reproduce that, but what we do see is that we get these complex sulfur, molysulfur interactions. And what we see is that, you know, in, in areas where we tend to have high abrasion, we get a formation of molyoxides. But where we see low friction, we, t we have this formation of these molysulfur, uh, these molysulfur interactions as well. You know, and that's particularly interesting when you consider, you know, tribochemistry, engine tribochemistry, where the interactions between molyoxide and molysulfides are, are, are well known. What we don't know is the exact nature of those, and that, that's work that we'll be, that we'll be conducting uh, going forward. And again, these are, you know, these materials are, you know, whilst they're affected by the, 
uh, by the by the lubricant that we use. They're also affected by you know the nature of the applied electrochemical potential. You know we can manipulate the the friction response by quite simply changing the voltage that we apply between our between our tribal couple and, and the potential step. And we can ultimately see that you know these these protein or these organic container solutions are very sensitive to this this voltage that we apply. You know, and so they they indicate that they they interact and they're involved in these in these electrochemical processes, which are, which also are interlinked with the with the tribology. So, in addition to kind of trying to understand these complex degradation mechanisms, we're also very interested and in, we're active in kind of progressing the testing of these materials. And one of the things that we're you know that we recognise is that you know we, you can only go so far with using simple tribology methods, you know, and really what we need to do is kind of progress our understanding to more complex kind of uh, comp complex tribological tribal corrosion simulations where we make use of biomechanical loading uh, uh, situations but we also include the addition of these in-situ sensors as well so things like corrosion uh, electrochemistry micro motion uh, but also things like acoustic emissions as well and then we've also when we're also now starting to look at things like microfluidics for looking at um, looking at uh, in-situ wear measurements you know, but ultimately what we want to do here is use these use these techniques to to both better understand the degradation mechanisms but also to accelerate some of this testing which currently relies on like really long-term iso astm type standards where you've got to put your samples in you leave these machines chugging for millions of cycles for months on end and you essentially get five data points of gravimetric weight loss which doesn't really tell you a great deal about anything really other than you've lost some material somewhere along the lines you know and what we know is that that material loss can come from a few different sources you know so some of the work that that we've been doing uh, that rob beadlin has been doing has really been instrumenting these simulators so this has been a, a simulator that was instrumented with a cobalt chrome metal on metal contacts with electrochemistry and the aim of this study was really to to understand the the effects of adverse biomechanical loading on the corrosion you know and essentially what we're able to see is that by having these adverse biomechanical loading processes we can we can exacerbate the the corrosive losses by nearly an order of magnitude compared to kind of standard ISO type gate uh, processes. But what you see with these mass losses is that they only increase by, you know, in the order of five times. You know, so what this tells us is that, you know, you you can change these inputs to be to be more patient specific. If you're relying on gravimetric weight loss measurements, it's going to tell you that your that your material loss or your global material loss has, has increased by five times. But ultimately, the mechanism for this material is 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 due to an an enhanced corrosive loss. So we've we've enhanced that corrosion losses, and, and we've essentially uh, um, <clears throat> uh, we've lost the material due to that that chemical dissolution. But what this really means is that when we come to design something, we need to think about how we design a surface, how we design a you know and what the requirements from that surface are in terms of in terms of mechanical properties, but also corrosive properties. You know, so things like hardness, modulus. Um, you know, you know they are relevant, but they they come somewhat redundant when we start moving towards you know trying to understand you know what we need from a chemical point of view as well. You know, we can also use these. So we, you know, we, you know, we've essentially got a, a cup in a, a cup in a sphere here. You know, it's a it's an idealized tribological contact from a lubrication point of view. You know, and, and by doing some high resolution electrochemistry, we can also start to unpick the fact that you know these corrosion processes are also linked. And, and, and link somewhat to these uh, uh, to these lubrication processes as well. You know, so we can adopt. You know, we can measure current. Uh, you know, in the that, the simultaneous current that occurs. You know, at, at maybe about two hundred hertz. We can then plot that. We can then synchronize that with the biomechanical motion, and essentially we see that. You know, we get this good correlation between the lubrication and essentially the uh, essentially the corrosion as well. Now, one of the things that we that we have questions that do come about is how do we how do we now replicate and and represent a uh, um, represent a cohort or this ever ever aging kind of uh, demographic? And you know, some of the work that we did with lifelong joints was really to you know to, was to kind of question the ISO and the ASTM standards that are used, where where they where they um, where they prescribe a very simple loading profile as we saw before a gate profile where you have a typical twin peak some flexion extension motion uh and some and some internal rotation 
and really start to ask, you know, how do, how do how does patient gait and how do patient activities vary to that? You know, so working with uh, working with uh, clinicians at, at, at the teaching hospital, we've you know we've studied the gait of these of these patients and and then use those to inform our simulations and to put them back into the into our joint simulations. And essentially, what we see is that the the gait profiles themselves are very different to the standards that we use. You know, and so the bottom image here is an ISO. It's an ISO 14242 walking cycle. And essentially the walking cycle that we received from the patients was very dif different and didn't really represent what, what the ISO standards were, were, were asking for. You know, it, you know, by the fact that the, the loading was lower, you know, maybe from a tribological point of view, you know, you might think, well, if a, if a normal load is lower, your wear is going to be lower. Well, the kind of data, data that we got contradicts that. But we've also got the addition of these additional axes of motion as well in you know medial lateral in and out of plane motion which aren't accounted for and actually what we find is that these these smaller motions are actually more detrimental than these than these larger motions which you know from a lubrication point of view and from a corrosion point of view we've actually seen that it you know it tends to actually reach a, a steady state in terms of a depassivation and repassivation and again we we can put these into the simulator. We can run them so a similar setup as to the one before, but we've just varied the load. But what we see ultimately is that um, uh, you know we get very different current responses based on the material that we based on the profile that we put in. But these profiles, but the current response that we get is actually a lot greater. You know, so we see we're seeing orders of magnitude of current greater compared to the standard to gate gate profile. And ultimately, that is because, or our hypo hypothesis is, is that when you're walking, you know, within the simulator itself, and and somewhat in 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 reality, you walk with your, um, you know, the contact patch and the contact area is, is usually well defined. You get a bedding in, and your material, be, you you know, your interfaces become more conforming. But as soon as you move to these more these higher activity profiles, or you start to change your daily living activities, you're essentially moving into areas of material which are not bedded in. Uh, and you're essentially essentially depassivating fresh areas of material where you probably don't have a, this tribal film formation, you don't have the surfaces that are bedded in, so you don't have the enhanced lubrication. Uh, and and as a result, we see that you get these higher higher currents uh, generated as, as a result. And similarly, when we've then put these into and we've done a we've done a standard wear test configuration using just a basic polyethylene sample, what we see is that you know even though the loads are lower for um for these uh, uh the actual loads are lower for these patient derived gates essentially what we find is that our that our wear the mechanisms of wear and our wear rates are become you know very different you know so what we see with a with an iso 142 is that we initially have a, a higher higher rate of bedding in and which then plateaus off as we uh, as we get the surfaces that conform we get a shakedown of the asperities but essentially with these uh with these with these uh patient derived profiles we don't see that and uh, and if you squint your eyes if you squint enough you can you maybe be able to kind of argue that you're actually seeing an uptake in that wear rate as well as it as it progresses so again this is ultimately because we have this you know you know loading in these situations isn't everything and also you know ultimately it comes down to the kinematics and, and the motions that we're applying to these these devices so the, the third part, and uh, I realise I picked up the pace a bit because I realised that we're starting to run out of uh, um, run out of time here. Was is really around the kind of the engineering, the functional surfaces as well. You know, so we, you know, we, it, it's not it's not a kind of core activity, but as a side to as a side to kind of a mechanistic understanding, we, you know, we've also had, um, you know, we're also involved in the development of different materials and particularly coating materials for for trying to enhance. Uh, the longevity of these materials, you know, and, and coatings within this within the biomedical area do have some success. They have some legacy, um, but they're they're also somewhat tarnished as well through kind of high profile cases of failures where you see spoiling of these coatings, delamination, kind of corrosion of of, of the of the uh, uh, of, 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 of interlayers, and essentially, you know. Coating companies are you know they're really interested in pushing these these materials because you know. The concept of having a having a base material that we can then functionalize to have you know enhanced properties is really promising but from a from an industry an orthopedic industry point of view there's a lot of kind of skepticism around the around the use of these coatings given the given the failures of the kind of we'll call them the first generation of, of, of coatings <clears throat> 
you know, these are typical failures that you see. So these are these are what we would probably define as being first generation coatings. You can see that you've got these delamination de or localized areas of corrosion. Coatings being removed. You know, some of these are DLC coatings. Some of them are zirconia dioxide coatings. <clears throat> you know, some of them are titanium oxide coatings. But ultimately, we see that these coatings, you know, when they've been used in vivo, have been removed, and they, you know, ultimately have been have required some revision. You know, so the surgeons had to go back into the patient to remove those coatings. So some of the work that we did with with iron bond as part of lifelong joints was really to to re-engineer this interface you know so we you know we knew that from these initial this initial work of tega uh you know dlc coatings were, were promising but they had this issue with with silica silica carbide dissolution and essentially one of the things that we that we wanted to do was engineer this interface to to give us something that was graded to kind of avoid to avoid this this localized corrosion of the interface and again, we tested these within within the simulators, you know, ISO profiles, even though, you know, we, we recognize that they don't represent essentially it's still there as a gateway to um, as a performance gateway that we need to uh, need to assess. Um, but essentially, we, we can then measure the wear with uh, CMM or red looks measurements, uh, well, CMM or, uh, or Alicona measurements, we can look at the distribution of these wear and then and then compare these or benchmark them to a to a to a, an uncoated sample. But essentially what we see here is that by the inclusion of having a coating on this surface, we can see that we, again, we, we very much changed the, the appearance of that wear, but also the mechanisms and the wear rate. And what we can infer through, through the use of these DLC coatings is we, you know, we, we can reduce, we can, well, we, we change the wear mechanism itself. So we don't see this bedding in, but we can ultimately achieve relatively low wear rates from, from the outset. And when we look at the surfaces, we can see that, you know, this is primarily because we've got a reduction in uh, a reduction in the abrasion that's taking place. You know, so we can see with the metal on poly, we see, you know, typically signs of abrasion on those surfaces. But also, you know, compared to the DLC, we, you know, we, we, we you know, we, we have a relatively smooth kind of defect free texture um, to that surface that we um, that we didn't see with the metal on poly. Now, the mechanisms of this are interesting because, you know, the the use of DLCs in, you know, the mechanisms of DLC friction within other areas are, are known, you know, kind of high pressure, you know, high speed environments, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of well established. And, and a lot of the kind of a concept has been translated to, to biomedical uh, areas. But what we've seen with the Raman measurements is that, you know, these materials remain in their same form. So you don't get any kind of SP2 to SP3 transformation. And actually what it leads to is it raises questions about, you know, is, is this because these essentially these surfaces are, you know, less corrosion resistant, they're more compatible with the environment, which ultimately means that when you have any, any signs of abrasion, you know, the, the corrosive components of those abrasion processes are reduced. And essentially you're, you're reducing the chemical contributions to that wear. And, um, you know, I've debated this for a long time with, with, uh, with, uh, with my colleagues and I, you know, I, I kind of firmly believe that, you know, whilst we think that metal on poly is purely a, a me is, is purely a mechanical wear process, I think there's actually quite a strong element of, of, of chemical contributions to those, uh, to those wear processes that we don't really appreciate actually. And then again, we've been, you know, we're, we're doing experimental coatings analysis. So, you know, leads with, we're quite lucky to have a, a, an industrial scale PVD, PCVD chamber where we can deposit experimental coatings. And a lot of the work that we've been doing has been looking at silicon nitride coatings or silicon nitrogen containing coatings. And initially this was done because they, they were done uh, because silicon nitride has some interesting properties, both from a, a wear, a wear, uh, wear part, particular point of view, but also from a, uh, um, but it, they've also got pro uh, interesting properties from things like antimicrobial, pro-osteogenic uh, pro uh, uh, properties. And also antiviral properties as well but essentially we you know we know that we can deposit these films down onto the surface you know we can you know they're essentially biocompatible <clears throat> biocompatible but, but we can engineer these films to give us very different properties depending on the ratios and the stoichiometry of those coatings and 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 you know which are which are ultimately based on the on the deposition parameters and again this this translates through to to both functional properties so we can see that both the, the hardness of these coatings uh, increases with increased nitrogen. And we can see that that is linked with uh, uh, linked with, with the wear response of these materials. And similarly as well, we see that 
the corrosion of these or the tribal corrosion is affected as well. So for you know cobalt chrome, we see that we get this kind of typical OCP evolution where we see that you know you start sliding, you get this decrease in OCP because of abrasion. And essentially, when we've got these coatings on the surface, we can we can engineer them to get to get around that synergy. Um, but it comes with a trade-off of the fact that you need relatively high nitrogen content within these coatings, which reduces the dissolution, increases the hardness, which may be good for some applications. But when we then start talking about antiviral, antimicrobial, you essentially need some of that dissolution to take place to give you your antiviral and your antimicrobial properties. So whilst we can engineer these coatings, it, you know, again, it becomes a balance between, you know, what do you want as an application and what are the fundamental mechanisms at that interface that drive driver requirements for that application. And again, these are just images of a wear track. So we can see that we, you know, we can essentially we've increased in nitrogen content, our wear decreases, and we get some, you know, we can we can reduce that wear quite significantly. And finally, I'm 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 a great believer that the that the that the human body has engineered itself over millennia for a, for a specific reason. You know, and whilst as engineers we like to we like to make things harder, you know, we like to go faster. Uh, and we like to make things stronger. The human body has has done a miraculous, uh, has, has engineered itself miraculously, and it and it's done it using soft materials, you know. And, and some of the work that we have been doing is really to translate some of the soft matter concepts um, that have been developed in in, in like polymer physics uh, and in polymer science over to to the biomedical application, where we ultimately want to use you know polymer functionalized surfaces, you know, either polymer brushes or gels. To enhance the lubricity within the within these contacts, you know, most of the work to, to date in this area has been done using micro or nano tribology methods. And what we're interested in now is is translating that up into macro sized real you know realistic contacts. You know, and we've developed some quite nice single single stage photopolymerization methods where we can put you know where we can attach polymers onto a, onto a surface of cobalt chrome or stainless steel. Just has to have an oxide. We can form these very, very thin layers on the surface, you know, you know, tip, well, I say very thin layers, they, they tend to be in, in the, between 500 to maybe one, one micrometer, 500 nanometers to one micrometer. But essentially these layers are soft, they're slippy, uh, and they, uh, and, and they also impart when we, when we've looked with electrochemistry, some, some corrosion properties as well. But from a friction point of view, we can see here that, you know, these layers that, you know, and these were taken at, contact pre these these were conducted on a on a on a on a on a traditional tribometer pin on plate tribometer with contact pressures in the region of about 200 megapascals we can see that we can have you know massive ma you know great reductions in in the coefficient of friction getting down towards super lubricity in here depending on the con on how you configure your contact so when we have these these soft layers rubbing against soft layers we can ultimately get coefficients of friction that are sub 0.001 and so far, we've struggled to to remove these layers, unless you then, unless you go to really, really, you know, gigapascal contact geometries. So, just to finalise, so we're kind of in a we're in a, the area of orthopedics and the area of biomaterials, particularly for for hips and kind of joint replacements, is in a is in a bit of a weird area at the moment. So there's, there there has been a lot of work done uh, within within this area. Um, you know, joint replacement is considered one of the one of the most successful joint uh, successful surgical procedures within you know of, of modern history. You know, and, and certain joint designs do have excellent excellent uh, uh, excellent uh, outcomes. You know, some some joints have ninety percent uh, retention rates at, at twenty years. You know, and, and essentially this has come as a, as a, with the advent of ultra low wearing systems. Um, but I, you know, I somewhat believe that this is, you know, it's kind of come, you know, more out of luck than judgment in some cases. And, you know, there are still a number of hurdles that we need to overcome, particularly as we, we innovate for newer, uh, newer, uh, well, we innovate for these emerging demographics. Uh, and as, and as the changes and the requirements for these, these devices changes, you know, ultimately we need to develop, develop uh, new uh, new materials that can accommodate these, you know, and that we're now living in a world where we've got antibiotic resistance, you know, the, there are then needs for things like multifunctional coatings that'll give you both your wear corrosion, but they'll also give you your, uh, give you your uh, infection resistance as well. But along with this comes challenges within the testing, you know, and how do we test something, you know, that, that is going to be used within the patient population, 
but we want to test it within a lab using you know using automated equipment using testing that doesn't last you know that doesn't you know that replicates you know the life cycle of an implant but doesn't take a life cycle to to do you know so there are some some big questions about how we how we do this testing and how we approach the testing as well and I, I firmly believe that I think that we're in we're in a we're in the initial stages now where we're starting to see the kind of a convergence between um, you know these in silico clinical trials where they're where they're using you know digital technologies computational techniques where they're simulating demographics but I think that we're in this position now where we've got the opportunity to to align you know both the experimental and the standards uh, approach with these with these emerging technologies to really develop more more functional and robust testing. Uh, uh, for the future. So I'd like to thank you for your time. I realised that this was supposed to be a 40 minute presentation and it's taken me a lot longer. Um, but hopefully you found, found the work interesting. It's a small kind of snapshot of what's going on. Um, some acknowledgements there, but you know, really a, a lot of this work and the continuing work is, is will be done by the guys that are, that are in the lab now. Um, some of them are on this call. And essentially, this has been funded by by a number of different sources, mainly EU. Um, you know, the links hit are here if you want to follow the activity of those uh, projects. Thank you so much for that, Mike. That was a great talk. So, what I'll do is uh, we'll quickly hand over to our partner Brooker, uh, who will share a quick um, uh, presentation with ourselves, and then we'll come back to Mike for a few questions if you have time. Over to you, Brooker. The R&D guys do R&D, and if it works, I don't, I don't see them, because <laughs> it worked, right? Uh, but if, they, if they're developing something and they start to have some problems, you know, a typical example might be a clutch mechanism. So they basically design these clutch mechanisms, they put them on dynamometers to test them, and if they start to get noise or they don't get the right friction or whatever it is they're after, then they'll bring them to me and they'll say, okay, this one worked, this one didn't, tell me what you can see. So really, it generally starts with a problem. What typically happens, I get a phone call. Someone calls me and says, hey, I was referred to you by so-and-so, I've got a problem, right? The problem could be anything, like maybe my brakes are making noise or they're not making noise, okay? So the first question you usually ask is actually what I call the scale of interaction. What, when you say it's making noise or it's not making noise, do you know where the noise is coming from? Is it indeed the brake pads engaging on the brake or is something vibrating something else? Because if it's something vibrating something else, it's probably not related to my stuff. It might be a structural problem, right? So we got to deal with what I call the scale of interaction. Once we get it down to that, yeah, this noise is emanating from something like two parts coming together, then it's a question of, well, what's the size of the parts that are coming together? Can I even measure those parts? Or can we cut a piece of the part away? Um, or if we have to make what we call a replica of the part, where we actually make an impression of the part and measure it. Uh, so a brake rotor on a typical car is pretty much the biggest thing I want to deal with. Even truck rotors can, like an F-150 truck rotor can get pretty big and it's not that easy to deal with. Um, and so that kind of gives you a feel of the size of the part. Uh, but like I say, most of the time the, the tribology problem you're dealing with is acting over a small size. So once you've narrowed it down to the interacting components, now it's a question of, okay, can I position the parts in such a way that I can measure them, looking for the surface texture differences between them. For the most part, uh, the instrumentation we have from Bruker can handle pretty much any material. It could be highly reflecting, it could be dull finish. I can, I can measure you know, black rubber surfaces uh, with a little bit of patience and you can get a really good measurement of that surface texture. So usually most materials we can measure. Uh, the only other thing to watch out for is if the material is composed of any multi-layers of films that are somewhat transparent, then that can cause some trouble since we're using an optical instrument the light kind of goes through those transparent films and cause some problems. So you have to be a little bit uh, aware of that. Other than that, as long as it can fit under a microscope, that's why I usually say to customers, if I can put it, if you can look at it under a microscope, I can probably measure it. And once I can measure it, then it's a question of understanding what the potential mechanism is of failure or problem. If it's a noise issue, if it's a wear issue, if it's a leakage issue, if it's an appearance issue, 
you know, what is the actual issue? How do they describe it? I have a, what's called a uh, Bruker NP Flex, which is a 3D optical profiler, which allows measurement of large parts and small parts, both in very smooth situations, like a super polished mirror, all the way up to a very rough part, like maybe a, a brake rotor or something that's been shot blasted. Um, that's the one instrument I use for surface metrology. And then together with Bruker, we've set up a lab which has a Bruker UMT, which is a universal mechanical tester, which allows the measurement of friction and wear of components by rubbing them together in different configurations, be it a pin on disc, four ball test, or whatever kind of configuration you want. So throughout the year, the Bruker people and their experts are here demonstrating the machine and doing projects for people, um, as well as developing applications for different people in the auto industry. Tribology is everywhere, all around us. Is every the science of friction, lubrication, and the wear science of friction, answers lubrication to everyday questions: which rubber grips the road better? Which coating resists wear better? What material offers the longest life? The lab itself is an experiment in tribology. Before, you needed seven testers to meet every tribology need. Bruker gives you a complete tribology lab in one universal mechanical tester, configured to run macro, micro, and nanoscale tests, all under real-world conditions. Changing configurations with ease just wasn't possible before UMT. Bruker's UMT makes it quick, easy, and possible. We've combined this with a very large work cell with easy access and great visibility. And all of this helps to keep the focus on the science rather than the tools. We designed UMT for versatility and modified it for excellence in testing material properties, revealing point of failure of coatings by scratch testing or determining material hardness and modulus through nanoindentation. Bruker UMT delivers versatile tribology and materials testing on a single platform without compromise. Understanding tribology in the lab unlocks real-world product functionality. Tribology is all around you, and Bruker is here to help you with locations around the world. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we'll get back to taking some questions uh, from the audience, so um, hopefully we might be able to answer them. So let's start with a few questions. Um, it should appear on the screen. And the first one is, um, can you explain what the surface uh, dissipation plot is telling you in AFM uh, of the ground um, cobalt chromium on slide eight? Yeah. So I think the yeah so the, the, yeah I mean the surface dissipation is, is essentially you know what we it gives us a it gives us an indication of the surface energy of, of that surface and uh, I think what we you know our, our analysis of this kind of suggested that we had these localized areas you know which which correlated with cut with the carbide formation where we had these higher surface energies you know and, that, and and essentially that's it becomes an important consideration when you're thinking about grain boundary bulk material interactions and if, if you you know if you potentially do have any susceptibility for you know initiation of corrosion at that place is where you might have galvanic interactions occurring uh, you know an accelerated corrosion brilliant um next question is in slide 12 the polarization um oh sorry in slide 12 the f first top graph on the left hand side 
uh, is that showing a passivation then uh, breaking down the film or and repassivation? What is this uh, solution test for this case? Yeah, exactly. So this, so this, yeah, so this is a cyclic polarization curve where we've essentially broken down the film, and then we've uh, we've increased the current, we've in, increased the well the over potential so that we that we reach a current of five hundred microamps per centimeter squared. So the reason we do that is because we we keep on increasing that voltage to that point because we we kind of assume that once you reach five hundred microamps, that if you've got any pit formation that's taking place. The pits are sufficiently um, formed. The, the sufficient, you know, the chemistry in those pits will be sufficient enough that if you're going to have propagation of those pits, it will it will occur. So if you've got any localized corrosion, it'll take in place. And essentially, what we do is once we've reached that point, we, we then reverse the voltage. But what we can see is that you know, with these cobalt chrome alloys, we break the film down. But as soon as we start reversing that voltage, we have a uh, we have a uh, we basically have this repassivation that's taking place, and we don't get any positive hysteresis and in fact what we see is we get this negative hysteresis which kind of suggests that there's you know it, it goes the other way and that there's maybe some change in that oxide film that maybe gives it some additional protectiveness uh, to, to that system now in terms of the lubricants so the i mean this represents a whole range of lubricants it's kind of a busy slide but we you know we tested sodium chloride phosphate buffered saline solution and then we tested them with the, with the addition of pro like bovine ser bovine serum albumin proteins with with increasing uh, concentration. Brilliant. And I think uh, on the same slide, um, the polarization curves in the cathodic region below the steady state region shows a reduction of BSA, uh, PMS. It'd be, it would be interesting to, to know more about this and how this will affect oxide stability. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. So, I mean, I think the uh, I, I skipped over this because I I realised that I was uh, kind of getting short on time. But when when you get down into the cathodic regimes of these materials, um, the interactions with both well with with the proteins become actually that's where the interesting interactions occur. And what you find is that you you because you're changing the interfacial pH, but you're also changing the charge at that surface. The interaction with the proteins completely changes compared to the anodic direction. And what we actually see is that you, that you get thicker protein films formed on those surfaces, and they they have very different electrical properties as well. It's interesting. Um, next question: um, Your pin-on-plate contact pressure uh, is about two orders of magnitude higher than in vivo pressures. Is your method justified? Yeah, uh, yeah. Another good question. I think the uh, I think the answer to that question is: What is a what's an, what's a What's an in vivo contact pressure? I think the I think we we typically talk for uh, you know hard and hard joints, you know tens, twenties, and megapascals, but they're under you know kind of standard joint loading conditions. You know as you as, as soon as you start moving to more adverse conditions, those contact pressures will go up. But it it also depends on the geometry as well. So you you know if you have conditions where you're you know it kind of goes to the more extremes, but you can achieve. You know, contact pressures in the area of gigapascals, depending on how your components are orientated as well. So, yeah, it's it's a good question. I think the I think the the fact is is that the contact pressures can range from being very low to very high, and uh, it you, you, yeah, you're kind of somewhere in the middle, really. Or you you, you try to be as, as best as you can, really. Great, thank you for that. Um, next question is how to distinguish between the wear loss due to tribal movement and due to corrosion. Interesting question. Yeah. So yeah, if you could, can you show the slides again, Tawid? Yes. Um, so we're on to yeah. So oh, sorry. Yeah. So we essentially because we we integrate our our tribometers with electrochemistry, we we can essentially measure corrosion under static conditions, and under dynamic conditions, uh, and we can we can run a series of different electrochemical tests where we can identify what the baseline corrosion rate is, but also then Look and see what that is under dynamic conditions, and you know we we use we typically use DC methods. We can we we are using AC methods as well uh, uh, to do this, um, but essentially you uh, you you need you calibrate your data against a, a a volume loss measurement, and then it's and then it's done via um, you work out your contributions through mass balance. So you know from 
VSI, you know, gravimetric assessment, how much material you've lost. We can estimate through the electrochemistry how much has been lost from corrosion. And then you can also then use the electrochemistry to, you know, completely stop the, any corrosion happening as well. You know, so we can take it just to a pure wear point of view. And that's ultimately how we can access the synergistic interactions as well. Brilliant. Um, next question, final two questions are, uh, how many micropores do you have in your DLC coatings? Yeah, yeah, another good question. I, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I mean, the, the the surface analysis that we did on the uh, on on the on the commercial coatings was was just very basic. I mean, you see the odd defect. I mean, they're they're, they're definitely a lot more defect free than than the experimental coatings that we have. But you you kind of expect that anyway because uh, these things are supposed to be validated, you know, well developed coatings. So. I'm afraid I'm afraid I can't give you a, a a quantitative answer to that, but they were, you know, from from optical evaluation, they looked you know, they looked fairly defect free. Fair enough. Um, and the final question for today: um, What methods do you use to functionalize um, metals to graft polymer brushes on the surface? Do the uh, brushed uh, surf, do the brush to reduce the roughness of the surface? Is yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we use a so we use a, a wet chemistry method where we use a essentially it's a photo initiated process. Um, I mean, the novelty is is that we so we silenate the surface with the silane that we've that we've designed, um, and essentially it removes the need for any initiator. So we're just working on the fact that we've got a a double bond, double uh, you know functionalized double bond silane or silane functionalized with a double bond. And then essentially the UV interacts with that and the and the polymer to 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 have a grafting a grafting uh, a grafting from mechanism. So we have a, a photo initiated mechanism uh, method uh, for doing that. Um, <clears throat> quite nice and simple. It you know it, it kind of gets around a lot of the long chemistry paper you know long a lot of the long chemistry processes that you see uh, within the chemistry papers, but at the but at the caveat that they're less controlled. You know so they you know we what we find is that we get, you know, we get polymer. I don't want to use the word polymer brush because it's, it, it, it implies that the, that your polymers are all in a, are all kind of extending from the surface due to steric repulsion. And I think what we've got is polymer brush systems, which then become entangled. So it's more of like an entangled gel network rather than a polymer brush system, um, depending on the grafting density. So it depends on how long you do it for. Um, but essentially, yeah, these things will graft to the surface you know, of as ground stainless steels, and they, you know, under dry conditions, they they reduce they reduce the uh, the roughness of those surfaces. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Mike. And um, that's the, all questions for today. Uh, so thank you all for your questions. I uh, just want to thank thank Mike again for this engaging talk. Um, really appreciate you sharing. Um, we'd like to also thank Brooker, our partner. Um, and a reminder, please do visit our website uh, where you can see uh, previous webinars and this webinar will be also available. So please do um, feel free to attend. Um, we will uh, aim to organize the next workshop in the new year on the 13th of January and our uh, next webinar will follow on the 20th of January. So please stay tuned on our website, emails and LinkedIn for further updates. Uh, we also have a fortnightly uh, newsletter, Modern Surfaces. You can sign up for this um, on our mailing list. Uh, you can sign up for, to our mailing list and you will receive this. Um, so we also ask for your support. Take the time to advertise these lectures um, to your contacts. And on that note, um, we wish you a, a great Christmas and a new year. And hopefully we shall see you in 2022. So, for, so that's it from us. So have a great day. Um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye.